Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Thanks for joining me once again, Fading Memories listeners. As always, I so appreciate you giving us some time out of your busy schedule. Today is going to be absolutely worth every last second because I have Melissa Bernstein with us and we are talking about dementia in the kitchen, how to how to help your loved one help you and basically have nice engagement. So thanks for joining me, Melissa. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be so, here. You are married to past guest, Dr. David Bernstein, who did the episode on how to get your seniors to stop driving. You want to help help everybody, help them, you know, continue being as independent as possible, help in the kitchen as possible. So we know his background, but why don't you tell us about you? Okay. Well, I'm an occupational therapist by background. And uh, an occupational therapist is someone that assist someone who has either had an accident or an injury or has some sort of disability um, and help them become as independent as possible in their daily living skills. So the occupation of living. So if you think of it that way, I can't tell you how many people said to me, oh, you're going to be an occupational therapist. You're going to find people jobs. Well, (laughs) not exactly. But in a sense, it kind of is. It's kind of the job of living. It's their their job. So if someone has a stroke and they're unable to use one side of their body or they have a visual impairment, an occupational therapist would come in and would help them retrain in their strengths and the functional abilities to be able to be independent in their daily living skills. And they, we work with children. So my beginning of my career, it was in pediatrics and uh, I worked in... Uh, physical disabilities and autistic children um, and children with low tone and um, cognitive abilities. So uh, that's how I started my career and then moved into uh, private practice where I was able to really expand my knowledge uh, in terms of uh, being in long-term care facilities, uh, outpatient clinics, uh, skilled nursing facilities, and Assisted living. I mean, really, we we covered the gambit of of all of those rehabilitative services. Um, so, for many years, I did that, and then became a manager and a partner, and expanded into management and recruitment and retention and all kinds of fun things that you can do with occupational therapy. And then we left. I left the company and started an online learning education company where I wanted to help others learn about what the kinds of education they needed for their licensure and certification. So that is part of my background. And when um, Dr. Bernstein, David, Dr. Bernstein, um, we started collaborating, um, I wound down my business and said, okay, we're going to go full force with, you know, working together and combining all of our years of experience to really help people age well, as well as caregivers to be healthier when they're working with their care recipients. Um, So that's a kind of a snapshot of my background. And I feel like I've come full circle um, with the cookbook that I wrote because I really wanted to help the caregiver do something different out of their routine. And they're so um, focused on all of the activities that need to be assisted with or done for a care recipient that they do not take care of themselves. Mm -mm. And so I wanted to, they just, they don't. And um, there's a large percentage of caregivers that say the first thing that they will say is that their health has failed since they have been a caregiver. And uh, it's this, this kind of activity which is purposeful for both the caregiver and the care recipient. We all need to eat. We all enjoy eating. Eating is a very, um, can be a very spiritual thing. It's definitely pleasurable. 
it's definitely pleasurable. We love, our, most people love to eat and um, it comforts. Um, and the things in the kitchen that you can do are, can be so meaningful. And so I thought about, well, I'm an occupational therapist by background. This is all about who I was for many years. And what can we do to bring someone with neurodegenerative disorder and that's someone with, with um, Parkinson's or dementia or Alzheimer's or other kinds of disorders into the kitchen for a purposeful activity. So that's kind of where this came from. Um, one of our clients had asked us to ask me to, to do a presentation to their caregivers. And I thought, well, let's, I've been a cook, I've been cooking for my whole life. And I, uh, sidebar is I did become a vegan chef. So um, I was especially fixated on food and preparing food, et cetera, and really wanted to then kind of spread those, all those positivities about being in the kitchen with a loved one um, to the caregivers and also to family members who work with their loved ones and want to make help them participate and remain part of the family or flow of their daily life. Well, my mom always wanted, you know, she's always asked, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And even giving her a simple task was not successful, I guess, because I needed to do it with her. I, the yeah. example I gave you when we were planning this recording was, it was Christmas. I was, I needed to crush up peppermint candies for the top of a um, peppermint candy cane cheesecake, which, oh, Yum. Yum. Yeah, I'm like, geez, I just had lunch and now that sounds really good. It's not something I eat very often. And, you know, I figured she was fairly advanced Alzheimer's at the time. My thought process was, you know, how hard is it to just smash the crap out of stuff that's in a plastic bag? And she would smack <laughs> it a couple of times and then say, what is it you need me to do? And after about three yeah. times of reminding her, I was just like please go sit in the family room and visit because you are making me yeah. insane. It was, it was stressful. Yeah. So I would yeah. not have um, willingly dove into having her in the kitchen with me again. Yeah. So, well, one of the things that, you know, maybe if you had kind of evaluated what she could and couldn't do, um, maybe you could have pared down the activity a little bit so that it wasn't uh, could stressful for both of you. Um, but one of the things that I included in the cookbook is um, actually it's called an abilities assessment, and it allows the caregiver to kind of go through what their care recipient is able to do in the kitchen, um, just do generally, just functionally. Um, you know, what is their strength like? What is their vision like? What is their spoon tolerance like? Um, you know, what is their upper extremity strength and mobility um, like? How's their balance? Uh, their coordination? And this is just a simple checklist so that before you pick uh, an activity or a type of recipe, you would kind of understand, like, what can they help us, me with when I make this? Um, and you're going to see when uh, with Tom, right, we're going to see Tom in a little bit mm -hmm. where, um, you know, he he has some limitations. So we were able to do the checklist with his daughter and we were able to gauge the activity appropriate for him. And he was able to engage and participate. So it's really important to understand what your the abilities of your care recipient or your loved one, and also what foods they like and dislike. Because if you do something that's really great for them and they love it, then they're going to participate more and they're going to wait for the fruits of their labor till the end of the recipe to be able to eat it with you. Um, and then coming into the kitchen, um, it can facilitate all kinds of memories. I have lots of wonderful memories about cooking in the kitchen with my mother and my grandmother. Um, and I think talking with a loved one about those kinds of things can really facilitate uh, memories and past reminiscence um, and can really help to have a very favorable, positive experience when you're in the kitchen. Makes sense. I think with my mom... I pro I probably should have done the crushing of the candy and uh -huh. let her sprinkle her it. Sprinkle it on, yes. Because the candy was in a in a plastic bag. So when you crush it, then the bag gets kind of opaque. So you can't really see what you're doing. And yes. the granite countertops I had at the time were that 
built and it's like that people are going to laugh at this statement builder basic granite so it's the one that looks sure. like kind of like the the dark chocolate chip cookie dough uh-huh. so it's the brown yeah. with the darker <laughs> browns so sure. that was busy you know because i'm i've discovered in these types of conversations that i think my mom's visual processing was just complete garbage because possibly she loved sugar which is not good for us definitely not good for our brains and you know she loved to bake she and my daughter baked from the time my my daughter was tiny uh sugar cookies and frosting the sugar cookies was their thing which more power to them that's a lot of work <laughs> uh-huh. um so what I asked her to do does not feel like it would have been a, as big a challenge as it was or the epic sure. failure that it felt like. So I'm assuming, knowing what I know now, that it was, you know, there, I mean, there was a lot of family, so it was noisy. Sure. It was dark. So the kitchen might not have been as, you know, brightly lit as she would have needed it. So, yeah, she yeah. would just sprinkle the, you know, red and white candies on top of the right white cake then the contrast might have been better for her. But of course, I didn't know that then. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it is a, it's a learning process. And certainly the first time the caregiver takes someone into the kitchen, you know, take it in small bites. Uh, you know, don't do a complicated recipe. Don't make it just really simple. And you don't even have to do the whole recipe at the same time. You can break it up into steps. So you can gauge how they're going to do by just taking a piece of the recipe um, and then maybe coming back after a nap or after lunch and finishing the recipe. So, um, you know, it it can get really distracting for someone in the kitchen. Um, And it sounds like, you know, during the holidays, it was, you know, quite distracting for your mom. That probably wasn't the ideal time, but she was in there going, what can I do to help? Oh, don't worry about it. Go visit with whoever was nearby. And then she'd like literally walk around the island. What can I do to help? I mean, it was like telling her sitting down and shutting up was not really an appropriate (laughs) response. Well, I mean, you you could have even had her fold napkins or have her do things that are kitchen related or dinner related, but not necessarily cooking part of the meal or cooking part of a recipe. So keep that in mind, setting a table, folding napkins, um, you know, those are things that could be helpful, you know, getting a, something from the cabinet, um, you know, so it doesn't have to be the cooking. It's, it's everything around the cooking that also can facilitate and be very meaningful for memories and, and um, engagement. Yeah, she probably would have been fine with any of those options. Um, I just assumed that, you know, smashing up candies and pouring them on a cake was pretty simple, but it just goes to show you it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why it's important to kind of, you know, kind of step back and see what really can they can't do and how are they in situations like this? And would it be better, you know, in a quieter environment? That's why I, I also encourage music during an activity if it's not too distracting. I mean, if it's, you know, because music also facilitates all kinds of memories. And, um, you know, it may be a memory that they used to play Italian music when they made an Italian meal or, <laughs> you know, so it could also facilitate memories and, and, and discussion about when you're, while you're cooking. That is true. My mom, this is really funny. My mom did not play music. My mom was a talk radio talk show person. Ah, so she probably well, guess, would have been listening to podcasts these days. That's funny. Well, I see you, you why you come up by it so naturally because your mom was in the biz. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, that's just that's just what she did because I have talked to several music therapists about, you know, connecting via music. And that was yeah. actually one of the catalysts for starting the show was that I could not find anything that worked to connect with her. And a lot of it was because my dad did 90% of the caregiving and then he passed away. And then it was like, oh, yeah, she's actually worse than I, uh, you know, when he was there as a buffer, it was, I mean, it was obvious. I knew I didn't, I wasn't under the misconception that she was not as far along as she was, but it, I didn't have the you know, like the daily kind of like the visual processing that when I kind of came, 
I came to that conclusion that she couldn't either read or process what she was seeing very well. Sure. When she kept telling my dad at restaurants, I'll have whatever you're having. My dad was mm. an atrocious eater. That man would have been mm. super, you're going to cringe. Just hold, hold on to your heart. <laughs> hold on to your heart because this was going to hurt. He would okay. have been so happy with a fried hamburger patty, mashed potatoes, yeah. and corn or peas for dinner every night for the rest of his life. Yeah. And that makes me cringe for multiple reasons. And yeah. their nutrition was trash. So yeah. <laughs> I have not, I'm not like that. I can't do that. Um, and I do, I'm, I haven't been able to do vegan too all, well, although I have an awesome vegan pumpkin bread recipe, which I'm going to link in the show notes because nobody would even know it's vegan. It's so good. Well, and most of the things I make, they do not know it's vegan. Any of the desserts or, you know, dishes that I make. People, they're happy to eat them because yeah. they're like, oh, this is so delicious. I never knew that eating vegan. I'm like, guys, it's only like no dairy and meat. I mean, come on. It's not like it's not like foreign food. It's all natural whole grain, fruits and vegetables. And I mean, it's just funny. People have a funny attitude about, you know, eating a, a, a plant-based diet. It's They just, you know, it's like, don't get me near that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually... It, it's it's there's a lot of good to it they're very delicious this, food and very healthy and good for you and you know excellent and, for you your know, brain excellent for your brain and you know dementia patients and alzheimer's patients specifically need to have special diets with which are reduced in sugar reduced in complex you know carbohydrates that are bad for you and fat so you know that they go for sugar you know you know that they go for the sugar <laughs> and so I recommend a lot of of balancing that with fresh fruits and um, desserts that are made from fruit rather than, you know, ice cream that's got a lot of sugar in it or dairy that's got a lot of sugar. Um, you can just whip something up in the blender that's very, very sweet and flavorful that has no sugar in it. So, um, you know, it, you have to think about what to give them to kind of get them off the track of eating something that's very, very sweet and sugary because that really is not good for anybody's brain. No. Sugar is, is, it's an addiction that is very bad in this country. It is. Very bad I, I, in this country. I, I eat a lot of fruit to help control my sugar cravings. And I also take a supplement that has helped a lot as well. But right. just, I was laughing because the first year my mom was in memory care, First off, my mom's name was Diane. Most of the listeners mm -hmm. know this. She befriended other Diane, and they befriended other other Diane. Oh. As if as if that's not confusing enough for those of us who don't have, <laughs> you know, memory-ish, cognitive issues. But other <laughs> Diane was, so I will never, ever forget this woman's birthday because she said she was two days shy of a witch. That means her birthday was October 29th. And the, <laughs> so the first year we were, she was there, um, it was just mom and other Diane and they had a family, um, basically it was a Thanksgiving, uh, buffet brunch kind of, it was at lunchtime, but it, it didn't have breakfast foods, but it was a buff, it was a spread and other Diane was tall and slender. I am five foot two and battle weight constantly. <laughs> and she literally had like three desserts because she didn't remember that she'd had the dessert. She'd be Aww. like, oh, I haven't <laughs> tried this one. And I'm thinking, Aww. I'm like, you have not put on any weight in the entire you know six months that I've known you. And you're eating multiple desserts today. And it, I bet you they were reduced sugar. They were very good. I only had one because I might have actually had half because I don't usually eat dessert at lunchtime. Uh -huh. <laughs> they did serve them a lot of like sugar-free popsicles and their food was really good. And it was, uh -huh. it was healthy because I remember asking, I asked him about the sodium in the, in the meal, the, the, the Thanksgiving, because generally, you know, like turkey and gravy and stuffing and all that uh -huh. stuff can be a little yeah. bit heavy on the salt. And it yeah. wasn't, and I didn't feel that it needed any table salt added. And they're like, oh yeah, no, that's salt free. And I was like, I don't know how you did it, but it tasted great. Didn't need salt. And it was, it was healthy. And, and the, except for the fact that it was a buffet, normally their mm -hmm. um, portion sizes were very re reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do we, how do we 
How do we get started with allowing them to help in the kitchen? Obviously, you probably don't want to wait until they're in the later stages of the disease. That just yeah, makes it harder. As soon as, as soon as you know you can, um, I would just do up do planning. Um, it's really important to plan um, and pre-plan your menu and even pre-plan your food. For example, if you're doing a fruit salad, you might want to buy pre-cut fruit. And so all they have to do is kind of, you can open the container, they can pour it in and they can stir. So again, it depends on what level they are and what their abilities and capabilities are. I did some work with a, a friend of mine who has Parkinson's and she's very high level, doesn't really have, but she has some, a lot of tremors. So we use things that were stabilized and weighted for her so that she was able to be independent. Um, but then we've got, you know, lower cognitive functioning like Tom, who you need to just dumb things down quite a bit um, so that you're able to take pieces of a recipe and, and put that together for them to participate. And again, any level of participation um, is of value and, and can be very meaningful to both the caregiver and the care recipient. Um, as you'll see with Tom, when we, when we show the video clip, um, and so, it, you know, it, a guide is really nice. And so what I did is in my cookbook, I did um, offer some guidance in the beginning. Um, there's the basics of what you need to do when you go into the kitchen. Um, you want to, you know, certainly safety, um, positioning um, for, to prevent falls. Um, you want to keep, you know, any utensils that <laughs> may be sharp or may be harmful to them. You want to keep them away. Um, and if they're able to engage with what type of recipe, what would they like to eat? What would they like to make? So, you know, engage them in the conversation of the planning, certainly if, if they're able to. Um, and then what kind of cueing are you going to be giving them? Are you going to be talking and moving their hands to do everything? No, you're going to guide them so that they can do everything as independent as possible. Oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times when I was in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living and the aides would want to do everything for the resident and the person that is trying to rehabilitate. And I would say to them, please set them up for them to wash their face or brush their teeth. They can do it. And that would save you time to just, you know, go do something else and come back because as long as you leave them in a safe um, situation and you can set them up, there should be, you know, you can do it independently and, and, and that saves on time for the caregiver. So oftentimes they're fostering dependence rather than independence because they're in a rush and they've got a lot of patients to see and they've got to get a lot done. So in the kitchen, we had the luxury of being able to pre-plan and being able to, to break down a recipe step by step so that any level of engagement based on their functional level um, would, will be beneficial. So you want to encourage their independence as much as possible. Um, and do you want to talk about the adaptive equipment maybe now? Yeah, let's do that. Cause, bit. um, so, and I like that you have the guide on like how to help cue them. Cause that's, yes. I think that's where I, I yeah, didn't I know it, that I needed to do that kind of stuff with my mom yeah, until I call it wait. compassionate cueing techniques. And, you know, it, it brings in, um, the thoughts about being respectful, number one, um, and at all times and no matter what they're doing, I mean, if they are having difficulty, just go through it, you know, just put a smile on your face and just say, that's okay, let's try it a different way. Um, so that they don't feel like they're doing something wrong. They, they're there to participate and to help. So you want to encourage them to do as much by them, as much on their, uh, on their own. And then accept wherever they are. You know, don't try to push something on them that's going to be too difficult for them to do. And then you can do gentle guidance with hand over hand or, you know, giving them encouragement by the shoulder or moving their arm or, you know, adjusting them so that they're able to be independent in their positioning. That so, makes sense. Um, yeah. So I, I have all those kinds of things and the type of assistance levels included in, in the book. Um, but then I also have a section in the back of adaptive equipment. And this is just a, just a snapshot of 
the kinds of things that I, I think are really beneficial, like these knives here. Those knives are plastic, but they are, um, they're serrated and they work really well. They're, they're great for children and for adults. And, you know, children learning to cook in the kitchen, or even if you take children in the kitchen to do an activity who may have a disability, these would be really great. And they come smaller for children as well. I got the medium size, but they come in a smaller for children. So it, it, these, these are great um, to use. They're very lightweight. So, you know, um, but if someone does have tremors and they need a weighted one, these would be a little bit difficult to manage. Okay. The one thing that I like with this, um, what we're showing, and you're talking about them for the people who are just listening, this is definitely a good YouTube episode to watch if you can, mm -hmm. yeah. um, is one of the things that I find is a lot of caregivers and and it's I think it's instinctive as much as anything else. It's like we're so afraid that something bad is going to happen to him. I think because mm -hmm. something bad has already happened, you know, that we just we helicopter, we hover, yeah. you know, and a lot of women that we're taking care of, like my mom and I'm sure other Diane and other other Diane and many people mm -hmm. that I've interacted with, yeah. you know, like you said yourself, both of us have cooked our like our life, our whole lives. So you've got mm -hmm. muscle memory. So it's like, yes. allow them to keep doing that. Definitely, you know, make adaptions where you need to so that they're safe. But, you know, the chances of something really bad happening, I mean, yeah, they might get cut. They might need stitches, but, you know, like. And if they make a mess, so what? You know, yeah. you clean it up. And if the <laughs> bowl drops in the ground, so what? You clean it up. I mean, it's just, again, you know, we can't hover. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure they're safe, certainly, but. You know, we, we have to let them, you know, it's like a child. Unfortunately, it's, you know, they've kind of back to when you're teaching your children how to be safe, how to be safe in the kitchen, how to, you know, position themselves, how to, you know, we were teaching them again um, how to enjoy these cooking in the kitchen um, with safety and enjoyment. Okay, so this next. Let's look at another one. Yeah, the next picture is basically a one-handed cutting board. It is, and it's got it's got a great little corner piece that you can push a vegetable against. It also has um, now that one doesn't have one, but there's a prong situation that comes up in a corner that actually you can put a potato on top of or uh, something that needs cutting that's very hard. And you can put that on there so it'll stabilize it. So you, all you have to do is um, just just cut. And we talk about that a little bit more in the video. But that's a nice, and it's also uh, suctioned onto the table. So it doesn't go anywhere, which is really nice. <laughs> um, really nice. But the corner pieces are really super because you can push a vegetable up against it and cut it and not have to, you know, have both hands involved. And this one looks like the knife goes into like a hinge for lack of a better term so you're just basically like literally this would be an adaptive tool for somebody who only oh, had this is a different yeah this is a different one than i have in the video so yeah mm. so what they, that would do is you put that is like a hinge it just holds the knife and you just cut, go up and down yeah so if you were one-armed like correct um, you know a lot of my listeners know i'm a big peloton user and they've added adaptive training classes and so one of their instructors is a uh, is an amputee. He's only got one arm. Wonderful. So this is perfect Wonderful. for somebody like him. Oh, I know it's great. Certainly. Especially when he like kicks your butt and you're like, yeah. <laughs> or my favorite is the pregnant wow. instructors. It's like, you'd think the class would be easy. She's eight months pregnant. And I'm like I falling know, off the bike trying not to die. <laughs> I know. I know. We use Peloton in our house as well. They're pretty amazing, these instructors. I yeah. haven't seen the amputee, the amputee instructor, though. I haven't seen him. I think he came on either in August or September, okay. July. He All hasn't right. been that. Well, his name is his name is Logan Aldridge. So you and they have a okay. whole section for adaptive. Um, oh, but, cool! I have to look at that. I haven't even seen that. Yeah, he's he's inspiring. Um, I bet. So, but I don't so this think would, he would need. I don't think he would need this board if he's doing Peloton. Uh, I would imagine. Well, he only has pretty, one he'd arm. He'd be pretty. Well, he'd be pretty dexterous with his one arm. I bet. You know, it's amazing. You know, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I was um, managing therapists and doing recruitment, I had a therapist, an occupational therapist that ha was born with no arms. Mm. 
she had small little, you know, like little, just not, no hands, no elbows, just a small little uh, part of her upper arm. And this gal, I went, literally met her for lunch. This girl was so dexterous with her feet. You would never have known. I mean, she held the utensil. It was like she was using her feet as hands. It was the most amazing experience I ever had. And she worked in pediatrics, which was a great place, I think, for her to work because she could, you know, move children, et cetera, um, a lot easier than she could an adult, I think. So she chose the right one. But she, you know, I mean, she was amazing. And um, I, I've met so many amazing people who go through these disabilities and, you know, make the best of them and have wonderful careers. This gal that's was a, pretty amazing. That's a good story for people to hear to kind of help ease you off the helicoptering caregiver. The con- and, and I, I think some of it's subconscious, this just constant worry about them. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like the worst has already happened. And like, I don't, I mean, I felt yeah. the same way with my mom, yeah. you know, she was in memory care, so I didn't have it quite as intensely because she wasn't with me every day, but yeah. I can totally see like, you know, no, it's okay. Just go well, sit on the couch. I'll take care I of the know. chopping. You know, <laughs> my mom is going to be 98 next month. And um, when she does come, it's the same thing. She wants to help. So I give her a little something to do. I like I have her set the table and I have her, you know, um, do things that are light because she's very frail. So I don't have her do anything that she's going to fall or anything because she's very, very frail. But she always wants to help. And I, you know, again, it's like you and your mom. My mom does not have dementia, but, you know, still she wants to feel um, important and, and she wants to have some value. She wants to feel like she can help in some way where they were such busy moms and raised us, you know, when you don't have that anymore, you know, you're really lacking that independence and that feeling of, um, that people want and care about you. Yeah. Having purpose. Okay. So now we have this set of really pretty color, pretty colorful knives. Easy for me to say. (laughs) Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement, and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, those are those would be really um, good for someone who's definitely high level because those are sharp. Um, but certainly um, the color coding can help with um, cutting skills so that is but they they have shields on them so they're protective so that's a good thing but they would need supervision for those if it's someone that really um was not fully cognizant of what they're doing now those are plastic but they're super sharp they are plastic but they're super sharp it's I, the, i've the, seen the, those the metal part is there's actually it's, there's a there's a plastic handle but the actual um knife part is um steel okay they're not 100 percent plastic i don't believe those are the 100 percent plastic ones and those are the cuisinart ones color coding would help me one i like color it's pretty but sometimes i'm never too sure which knife i'm using i just use what well, works <laughs> yeah the cuisinart they, they outline exactly which color you use for which type of cut, cutting so they would be really good for you they're great that i have a set of those i love them I have all kinds of knives. I have the coolest uh, magnetic. So it's a 
It's a knife. It's a knife holder that's vertical. And the yeah. knives just, they're, it's, the board is magnetic, so the knives just stick to it. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah, those are cool. That's very cool. I've seen those. Not, not seen cool those. for somebody, if you have somebody living with you that has dementia, no. because no, 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 they're no, right no, there no. in the agreed. open. <laughs> no, agreed. No, agreed. Agreed. Okay, so the next one, yeah. so this is some adaptive silverware. Yeah, so a lot of times folks cannot grasp well. They've lost some of their sensation. They've lost some of their grasp ability. So these larger handled um, utensils are really helpful. They also are kind of have a gripping material on them. So they're very helpful for maintaining a grip on a utensil and they're not heavy. So that's, that's good for someone who has, you know, decreased uh, strength in their, in their hands. Now I did see some of these and I don't know if this particular set, this is just one of the pictures from your guide, from your cookbook. Uh Uh-huh. Um, where the actual utensil part is, you can bend them. So if somebody's got like yeah. a hooked yeah. hand, for lack of a better term, the spoon yeah. can so, bend like forty-five yeah, degrees. Well, you actually have to bend. Um, you actually have to buy those, depending if they're left or right, a left or righty. That makes sense. So you pre you pre buy those, and they're for someone who doesn't have any wrist. Uh, flexion or extension. So, you know, when you, when you scoop something, you actually have to have rotation of the wrist and you have to bring it up. If you think about the movement of, of feeding. So if you don't have any movement, you just want to scoop. That's a perfect utensil that just scoops and brings the food to the mouth. Um, so you don't really have to have a lot of other mobility in your wrist. So those are very helpful because sometimes, um, especially stroke patients get um, some, some um, inability and tightness in their musculature. So it's unable, they're unable to have the same flexibility they had in their wrists and their elbows. So that helps to, to really, um, enhance feeding with those bent utensils. That makes there, sense. there is a name for them. I was looking for the name for those <laughs> there. I think they're called, I think they're called 90 degree flexion spoons or something. I can't recall the name of those, but. Okay. I can find that for you and put it in so the- this this set just looks like normal silverware. They do, but, it's, but they're which is good. good. Yeah, okay. they look just like regular, and that's those are really good because they do look just like you'd have them in your drawer. Um, but they're weighted. You can get them in different weights depending upon what the issue is with the care recipient. Um, they add enough weight and enough stability so that you're able to utilize them like regular utensils. Um, but they're not heavy enough that you can't lift them. <laughs> so, you know, so then again, you'd have if someone with tremors, this is a great for someone with tremors, um, because it does help to stabilize, give them a stabilizing force to, to eat with. So, um, weighted utensils are good for some individuals. Is there one of these adaptive utensils that you can recommend in general? which I know everybody's different, but like my mom started having difficulty eating and, you know, like getting the food to her face. She didn't have issues with her wrist. Like we were just discussing. I don't know if, a, I don't know if an adaptive. Was it arm? You, um, that, was it her I think arm? it was just like her brain. Her- oh, okay. Okay. Well, the, well, one of the last meals we had together, what she, she was pushing the food off the back of the plate. So she definitely needed one of those plates where that had the rim in the the back. The lift plates, Mm -hmm. yeah, they have rims. And you can move them around so that, you know, if you scoop in the back direction or forward direction or section, they they really are very helpful. But they also have, you know, elbow, um, there's an elbow rest. Mm. If someone has some weakness in their arms and their shoulders, they could, it's a kind of a mobile thing. So it's... And you just put your elbow in it and you connect back and forth. And so you could scoop and bring it up to your mouth and it's for for your elbow. Um, I might have helped and, her. Yeah, it sounds like she needed a little bit of guidance with keeping her elbow at, at the right um, height for her to be able to scoop the food to get into her mouth. Yeah, the um, food choice was not great. We What I had done yeah. is... Um, Taken her, I like picked her up the memory care, put her in the car, drove around the building to the assisted living mm-hmm. main entrance. 
because they had a beautiful yeah. dining room, beautiful, you know, excellent food. And the the week of Christmas, so this was 2019, we they had sliders. And she did okay with those, but, you know, they slide apart. Sandwiches slide yes. apart. You almost need, like, yeah. a clamp to hold them together. Well, there is a sandwich holder. You can buy sandwich holders. Exactly. Okay. And we have every type of adaptive equipment and occupational therapy that you could possibly imagine. You just have to search it. And you can or, or reach out to an occupational therapist. But there are these sandwich holders. And they hold a sandwich. And the person just holds on and brings the sandwich up. And it's, they're great. They work beautifully. I may have to try one of those. But she she was, so she was doing okay. I think if she'd had a little more strength or the, you know, the mental capacity to squeeze a little harder, but, you know, they slide apart and she fusses, or she did. She fuss, fuss, fuss. So the next week, because that was actually a very successful, very enjoyable lunch. And so I thought, okay, let's do that again. So I did the same thing. 100% difference because this time she got the beef tips and noodles. Okay. And um and literally probably 80% of the of what she just kept pushing it off the back of the plate. And then she fuss 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 brush it into the plate and, oh, 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 oh. and it's just like could you just please eat your food? I don't care if you eat it with your hands. I don't care if you eat it off the table. Just stop. I re I referred to her fussing as Alzheimer's OCD, because that's what it really mm. felt like. Well, and she literally spent most of the lunchtime, the, you know, I had kind of allotted about an hour because that was her, she, that seemed to be like her limit, it was definitely yeah. my limit by then. <laughs> and it was just, it was so frustrating. I have posted this picture before. I'll try to remember to share it with this episode. She was so irritated with me. She literally held the napkin up in front of her head turned her face away from me and was just like, I am done with you huh. because she was frustrated because the food kept going on the table. And I was like, um, you so know, she didn't having... have a special plate. She didn't have a special lift plate. No, this was so in the assisted, of... assisted living, living dining room. So yeah. it was also, they had white plates. The memory yeah. care had red ones yeah, that would have definitely helped, great. but yeah. literally the food just kept, it was, it was like she was pushing the Did food she... off the back of the plate with a rake. Did she use a fork or a spoon when she I ate? I think we tried both. I would have let Did her stab it with better the knife. With one? Did she do better with one than the other? No. I think part part mm -hmm. of it, when by, by the time I got her to switch to the spoon, she was irritated that the food kept getting on the table. And then she was getting irritated with me. And so switching utensils didn't help. I don't yeah. know if it would have. The shame I mean, they wouldn't were, have had an... OT come in and help you a little bit with some of that stuff. I'm sure they have a consult OT at the assisted living. Most, I wonder most if they did. Assisted, most assisted livings have a consult for OT speech and physical therapy. I'm, so see, I've, I've learned so much your, since my mom has passed away. It's frustrating. Well, for, your, for, for your listeners to know that, that it's really important to have an evaluation by an occupational therapist um, and even a speech language pathologist because they may have some oral motor issues going on. You know, once the food gets in the mouth, that doesn't mean that they're able to chew it and swallow it. So that's why um, an OT that is, OTs also do oral motor training, but um, an OT or a speech language pathologist can determine whether their dentures are in properly, whether they've got tongue mobility, whether they're able to chew and have enough liquid to chew and swallow. They may have a swallowing issue and which could cause choking. So those kinds of things that you want to be aware of, if your loved one is choking when they're eating, maybe the food is in big, too big of a chunk, or maybe they need a test called a video fluoros a video, yeah, video fluoroscopy, which is a test that they do to test swallowing. Video fluoroscopy. I want to say that right. Video fluoroscopy. So with the speech language pathologist, they go and actually a radiologist does that test. They give them something to drink with different thickens and different thicknesses, and then they see how their swallowing is. And if they've got a swallowing issue, they could aspirate and get pneumonia. So mm -hmm. it's really important that they, they, and especially if they note that they're eating and they're having problems chewing and swallowing and cutting in small pieces isn't helping. Um, and it's, they can note what type of food it is that they're choking most on. That's all helpful for a speech language pathologist to do the eval and, and make sure that you prevent 
some sort of choking situation where it can go to pneumonia. I was always surprised at how many of the really advanced cognitive um, people in the memory care, how many, how many of them actually ate soup? Now I know the liquid was good for hydration, but the liquid's good for hydration. It was very difficult to, you know, to swallow. If you get thickening, thickening liquids, I see a lot, you know, that helps to, to give them some control of swallowing, but really thin liquids are difficult for some patients who have swallowing issues. I mean, if you don't have a swallowing issue, it's not a problem, but if you do, they have the thickening um, in the dietary department that gets ordered for them to thicken their liquid so that they don't choke. I know a caregiver who her mom was pocketing food and yeah. falling asleep while eating oh because oh the chewing a lot of work. So yeah. they suggested pureed foods, but she has gone um, to very, and they have the, her mom's on a vegan diet, very soft foods so that you don't have to okay. chew too much, but she's, yeah, it's, it's a step before puree, which I thought was brilliant on her part. This gal is just, she's a 10 yeah. out of a 10 yeah. on taking care of her mom. That's and um, she just, her mom's been on hospice and she's, she's got some issues about 20 minutes after the evening meal. And mm -hmm. um, it causes, it, it appears to her that her mom is in pain. And so now mm -hmm. she's shifting when she eats the bulk of the calories during the day to earlier in the day and she thinks she's she's on the on the hunt for the the solution to that problem and she's she'll she'll find it she's halfway there already mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's just it's really interesting you know you just have to be a detective and it's you helpful do. to know um until recently i had no idea that ot's and slp's and all you know all the people in the therapies for lack of a better generalization <laughs> Um, I was like, why yeah. would I bother with any of that with my mom? Cause she's not going to remember, but now I've learned not necessarily about her remembering. It's, no, it's not. It's all about adaptation and it's about the family working with the loved one and making things as easy as possible. And, you know, it, your consultants are there, use them. I mean, it, it, use these folks who could just one, one or two little suggestions can can change the whole picture. It really can. And seriously, for the caregiver, you know, yeah. it can really be helpful to the caregiver. Yeah, I'm sure it would have helped my dad. Okay, so the next adaptive tool we have is like bands that the utensils... The we're uh, trying to just describe it for people who aren't going to watch this on YouTube. I might post these pictures on um, social media as well, but it's basically like a a band that goes around the back of your hand Correct. with the utensils on it. And I also saw and, when I was pulling these pictures out that they had them for toothbrushes and hairbrushes and combs and pencils and, and paper, you know, you can use them for, for writing. You can use them for, um, you know, crayons for kids, um, uh, toothbrushes, uh, anything that needs to be, anything that you grab um, can be attached to this little plastic a uh, rubber piece that goes on the back of your hand. And uh, so it, it's really helpful if somebody doesn't grasp any grasp. So Because all you really have to do is move your hand. Once it's in there, you don't really have to grasp it at all. So it really aids in, in weakness and grasp. I wonder if that would have helped my mom with the, those beef tips and noodles. Yeah, it would have been one and less. A, that and a lip and a yeah, lip thread dish would have been perfect for your mother. <laughs> I was basically at the point of trying to figure out how do I order. And I know the food that they served in memory care that was, it was the same food, but not always as the assisted living because what was it? This, the winter of 2018, they had a dress rehearsal for COVID. They had such a horrific flu outbreak in the assisted living that they mm. literally had to close the dining room and serve meals the residents in their yeah. rooms, mm -hmm. which impacted the memory care because the, the, the meals were brought over from the assisted living. So that's, I know what they ended up doing with COVID. I don't know that they closed the dining room cause I wasn't allowed in, but I'm assuming that's what they did. But yeah, yeah. I'm, for the most part, my they mom, have, my mom, ate, my mom ate in her room when oof. during COVID. But yeah. They brought the meals to the room. Yeah. The memory care, they didn't keep them in their rooms. 
So, but they did put part plastic partitions. They divided the square tables into four, you know, little triangles. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, uh, yeah. that would have annoyed my mother. So, but my mom was my mom was a little ornery, but that's okay. I was just kind of surprised, but they're clear, so I bet you most of them didn't even notice. So this yeah. last one is it's an interesting picture, and I would I debated on whether or not I should do this one or the one that actually had the utensil in it. But I'll let you well, describe it. So you can you can see that little cross hatch on the top, and that's where the utensil slides in the bottom of the utensil. So it can be used for a fork, a knife, a spoon, um, and it's really for um, enhanced grasp. So someone who has maybe has a weak grasp or who doesn't have a full grasp, this is really helpful for can't hold a utensil. This is really helpful for holding a utensil. I wonder if that Pretty was simple. A, um. So my mom passed away essentially from not eating or drinking due to advanced Alzheimer's. That's what her death mm -hmm. certificate said. I wonder if something like that would have helped. She was bed bound. And so we had food on the, in those plastic, the styrofoam trays, which are you horrendous. Mean, well, if she was, if she was able to still grasp and, you know, handle just, food going to the mouth, it could have been It just didn't seem interested. Her. It was weird. They'd put it well, in front of her. Know, if they get more advanced, they don't really care about eating anymore. They they really don't. It, it becomes it becomes a, a fight <laughs> to get them to eat. <laughs> well, she really fell don't. and broke her leg. That that was the that was the catalyst because she broke her leg March eighth, and she passed away March thirty first, twenty twenty. So I I got yeah only the small taste of having somebody in memory care during COVID, and then I didn't have to worry about it. Thank God I've told that story a mm -hmm. lot. Because she could not have done window visits and all that stuff. It would have, yeah, no, the stress was, level would have been horrific. I did it with my mom. It was very rough. It was yeah. very hard on her. Very hard. Yeah. I hope they're, I hope they are coming up with much better options because I know here in California, and it's only, it's, it's related, but the, you know, we've got like California schools were closed for almost two years, which is insane. But we had mm -hmm. a, you know, like half the population was like, you know, we can't, t you know, we can't take the risk. And the other half's like, I don't care anymore. Just get these kids back in school. And yeah, you know, right. somewhere in the middle would have been nice. But, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we've learned from these things because we didn't I know what was so. going on. We were trying to make decisions on the fly. And I, I just basically credit everybody with doing the best they can. And let's learn from all of that. All that data we have, let's learn have from a, it. We have a lot of resources now yeah. to, to help and prevent this from happening again. So if people, heed the warning and get their boosters. And I don't want to be an advertisement here, but it's really important to get your boosters, especially with the flu season coming up and, you know, get vaccinated. It's that's what's going to protect you from being in the hospital. Doesn't You may still get COVID or you still may get the flu, but it's going to help to, you know, a potential hospital stay, staying out of the hospital. Yeah, definitely. You know, I'd much rather have a mild case than, well, no case, which so far I haven't gotten this far without oh, it. Oh, good, good, good. Um, it's You're getting a little scary. I know. I don't know too many people that are still COVID virgins. So. Yeah, COVID virgins. That's yeah, funny. that's. I don't know if I like that term, but that's the one I've read. Is people <laughs> like me? Funny. I mean, I've, I've worked never, from home. I've never heard that. Oh, I've worked from yeah. home forever, and then, you know, I I do have to get the booster. Um, that's on the to do list. There's yeah, <laughs> always to do lists. So we have a video that we're going to play and narrate, okay. and um, this is of you working with Tom. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Tom? Okay. And then um, um, we'll show the video. Okay. Tom lives in a memory care unit um, and is, has been there for, I think, six years, uh, five or six years. Um, he is able to feed himself, um, but needs to be set up. And mm -hmm. needs some guidance. Um, he really needs full assist for uh, dressing and hygiene and bathing. He does have caregivers. His daughter, Jessie, um, goes every morning to help get him up with the aids and goes every night at six o'clock to feed him and guide his feeding and work with the aids. Puts him to bed every night. She does that every single day. This, she's a daughter that everybody would want to have <laughs> Put it that way. She really is lovely. And she's just totally gets it, you know, and 
So Tom was a former patient of Dr. Bernstein um, and had not seen Dr. Bernstein in, gosh, probably five years, four or five years. Um, so there's a, we don't have that on video, but there is a part where Dr. Bernstein comes in and he sees, Tom sees him and he just lights up. He recognized him and he hadn't seen him in a lot of years. So he just lights up and then Dr. Bernstein started talking about baseball and, and bat and, um, football because Tom was in the first two Super Bowls. Oh, wow. Yes. As a football player. And he played for the, oh my God, this is, this is bad, uh, Wisconsin. So he played for oh, that Green that? Bay Packers. That Green Bay Packers. He was Ooh, I'm Green not Bay even Packers. a football fan. <laughs> good, good. Thanks for the lead on that one. And he, um, yes, he also played baseball in his career. He, like he kind of left, but you know how some of those athletes leave, you know, leave and go in different sports. So um, Dr. Bernstein made a comment to him about, you never made one home run in your baseball career. Well, he just like started laughing. It was so wonderful to see how engaged he was when he saw Dr. Bernstein. But he also was very engaged in the cooking activity, as you'll see. Um, he was in his wheelchair, um, and we just pulled him right up to a table and were, were able to, um, I got pre-cut fruit for him. He was able to handle a knife and a small, like a plastic knife that we showed you earlier, um, or that you're going to hear about, I guess, because the people who are listening versus the people who are going to view it. Hopefully you guys will go on YouTube and, and view this. Um, and then um, it was, a, it was, he made fruit salad and he did a really engaging job. Um, he was limited in what he could able to do, but he was able to participate and it was, it was really a lovely experience. So I think with that said, if there's anything else, I'll kind of talk over the okay. video because there were some things in terms of the collaboration that's really important when you take someone into the kitchen. Awesome. So and here we oh, are. You can see it. Okay. So let's hit play. Welcome to the Power of Five Test Kitchen on location at a memory care unit where today we have are visiting with Tom and his daughter, Jessie, who is uh, one of his caregivers and probably the best caregiver there is. <laughs> and as caregivers, you all know how you're in a routine and you are doing all of your activities of daily living with your care recipients on a daily basis. Well, today we're gonna kind of shake it up a little bit and we're gonna do something different out of your ordinary routine. We are going to make a fruit salad with Tom and Tom is going to participate. The importance of bringing someone into the kitchen for a purposeful activity can be so meaningful. It can work on past reminiscence, it can work on engagement, and any level of engagement is, is just perfect. So uh, one of the things that we did first is we filled out a, a um, abilities checklist, which Jessie filled out about with her dad and it tells about the types of things that her dad can and cannot do. Sitting balance, what activities of daily living he can perform, his hand strength, his mobility, his vision, auditory. So you, I think you get the understanding that this is a very important thing to determine the level in which the recipe you pick and the steps that are involved in the recipe. We're doing a very simple fruit salad today, and Tom's very excited about the fruit salad. <laughs> and Jesse, I have one quick yes. question for you. Sure. So when you filled out this form, yes. what were the things that came out for yourself in terms of Tom's ability, and not only with cook a cooking in the kitchen, but his, his ADLs in general, and maybe his likes and dislikes of food? Yes, yeah, so I just really, it brought into perspective kind of the whole range of what fine motor skills he has and what um, adaptations he may need. Um, and just seeing his level of where it is now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was very simple. Very okay, simple very easy to do. Yeah. Did you have any problem filling it out at no. all? Okay, mm -hmm. very good. A lot of times, not only will we have the caregiver fill it out, but if able, the care recipient can also participate in helping to complete the form. 
So with that said, we are going to start making our fruit salad. And I want to share with Tom what we have here. We have watermelon. We have strawberries. Do you like strawberries? Yes. Grapes. Oh, those aren't grapes. Silly me. Those are blueberries. Do you like blueberries? Okay. And we have cantaloupe, which I don't think you like this cantaloupe. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll leave the cantaloupe out. So I have a couple um, knives that are plastic that work very well with someone that might have limited coordination and they're safe, which is very, very good. And then we have some um, adaptive equipment over here that I brought that you can see that there are ways in which someone can um, have a better grasp, Maybe they don't have any flex, uh, flexion in their wrist, so they might need a, um, a utensil like this that the fork is bent, so therefore it just goes easily in the mouth. Tom, do you want to try that for me? Oh, you're lefty. I forgot you're a lefty. <laughs> we'll try that one first. Good, so that one's a good one. Do you like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't have a left, this would actually be a left hand. This is a, for a right-handed person. Gotcha. <laughs> Yes, yes. I don't have a left-handed one. The other thing that we have is weighted utensils. Try that, Tom. What do you think? Is that heavy? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How about the fork? Is this heavy, too? Yeah. OK. Great. So I don't think we need the heavy ones for Tom. But Tom is so interested in my special board here that I'm going to share with you about this board. This is a special cutting board that adds um, these, these little areas over here help to uh, stabilize the fruits or vegetables that you may be cutting. But the really cool thing about this is what's under there. So this, these are nails, which are dangerous, mm -hmm. but don't you touch them, <laughs> where you could put like a potato or you could put something that you can stabilize on this side and cut. So I'm gonna leave this on here for our protection but we are going to go ahead and start with some watermelon. And I think you could cut this. So I'm going to go ahead and put some here. Here, Tom, you want to try that knife? See if you can cut that for me. We're going to, oops, sorry. We're going to cut it this way. And we, you can use a hand over hand method if you want to guide your care recipient on Helping with some cutting. Nice job, Tom. <laughs> really nice job. Great. He doesn't need much help. And we're going to go ahead and put that in our bowl. Hold on to that knife one more minute. We're going to do a couple more, Tom. Oh, okay. Let's do a couple more here. Here's one more. We'll do a couple more. You know, we'll put them side by side so we can do them together. How's that? Ready? Let's see if we can do all three together. Nice. Very nice. Good job. Good job. One more. Perfect. All right. I think we've got the watermelon taken care of. I'm just going to take this, okay? Put this over here. And let's go ahead and do some strawberries. These are going to be a little harder to cut, I think. Well, when you're watching this video, it's it's hard, because he's seated and looking down. It's it's a little bit challenging to see to to understand that he's actually engaged. So when you see that when he brings up his other hand, that you know he is making choices and and he is engaged. So that was that wasn't that was a nice little moment there. <laughs> It was. It was a nice moment. And then I wanted to see how well he did scooping the fruit up and putting it in the bowl. So, and I, and I noticed that his elbow was, was kind of uh, not moving as well. So you'll, what I did is I went, I don't know when I did that, but I kind of helped his elbow a little bit with, um, kind of getting it out of the way. 
Now and he's getting now creative Tom, with the cantaloupe. <laughs> yeah, Tom was supposed to be putting the cantaloupe in the bowl and decided that he was going to grab the cantaloupe and put it in his mouth, um, which which we loved. Um, and yeah, he, but he, he said he didn't like, like cantaloupe. I know, he didn't <laughs> like cantaloupe, but he, I guess, she, Jesse said he really did like cantaloupe, but he just, whatever, he said no, so maybe it wasn't his favorite. But um, then I do show the easy grip. Um, tool which is the rubber piece that i was explaining about earlier that fits on a spoon or other types of things it goes across the top of your wrist i i think my takeaway with the adaptive equipment is you know once you do the uh, abilities and just know and observe what they're able to do and not do. Certainly utilizing their hands in any way is the best so that you're not having an adaptive piece of equipment that they're going to have to kind of figure out or need guidance with. So the number one choice first would be to use their own <laughs> abilities in their own hands. Um, and now he's if, eating... If they really, yeah, now he's eating berries. Now he's oh, eating okay. the, the blueberries. <laughs> With his fingers, yeah. which is fine. Sometimes and that's which easier. Is, which is, you know what? Which is absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, he's getting his good pincer grasp. He's able to go from the bowl to his mouth. And um, now he's starting to use the, the utensil by himself. So he, you know, and he self-initiated getting the spoon. So this is where I help him with the, uh, his elbow, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, his elbow was kind of in the way. <laughs> so I was had to kind of get his elbow out of his wheelchair arm rest um, so that he was able to get that to his mouth. And he was very independent doing it, but that he in, he was engaging in taking the utensil and scooping and bringing the food to his mouth. So all in all, this activity, I think, was a home run, <laughs> to use a baseball term, yeah. because... Um, or we could say a uh, field goal. Uh, we could do with that for football. <laughs> um, because Tom really did engage. The other thing that I asked him about, I asked him about um, what did he used to make when he was younger and that Jesse, or with his children, and Jesse told me that he made really great pancakes with them. He, didn't, he wasn't a great cook, but there were a couple things that he made. So what I brought that up to him and asked him, you know, Jesse says you make a heck of a, pancake and he goes yeah so he like you know he remembers that he made pancakes with his children and um was really excited about that i brought that memory to life with him and that he was able to remember that so um he was he was really uh, and at the end you know i thanked him and i ha held his hand and he he was he said Great. I mean, he just like he didn't say a whole lot, but the words that he said were very encouraging and positive that he enjoyed the time that we spent together in the kitchen. And it doesn't again, it doesn't have to be an hour in the kitchen. This <laughs> this we were there for maybe a half an hour. This whole thing was about a half an hour. And which could have been a lot. I mean, you can do a 15 minute quick uh, time in the kitchen. But be prepared. Um, choose something that they like. Um, cook with kindness, um, enjoy the meal afterwards, have a great conversation with them. Even if they don't respond, talk about things that they like, talk about their childhood, talk about their siblings, talk about their children. So that you're engaging them for past reminiscence and ask them what kind of songs that they like. And if they're able to, um, bring you know music or songs and they're able to remember some things you could even bring dancing in i have a friend whose grandmother was in the kitchen and she put on some music they were cooking a dinner for the family and the mother was sitting at a table and i think she was like breaking up um simple things she was just like breaking up um a string bean she's breaking up the string bean and so they put on a song that was a song that they used to play when they were cooking, when they were, when these 
kids were young and the grandmother was the, leading the cooking activity. And she got a smile on her face and she wanted to get up and dance. So Linda helped her up and they danced in the kitchen because it stimulated the fun and enjoyment it was that music just stimulated the ability to, for her, she wanted to move. And movement is really important for these folks. Mm -hmm. um, exercise and movement and walking. So anything that you can engage them into movement, even if it's in the kitchen, when you're taking a break or you're cooking something, just take a break and dance around the kitchen. It's okay. It's okay. I enjoy dancing around the kitchen. But I listen to podcasts sometimes when I'm cooking too. So, <laughs> well, that's okay. That's you're learning. You're learning while you're cooking. My you're mom might see. Cooking. She might have enjoyed that. And I was always mm -hmm. hesitant to play my show for her because of the topic. Yeah. Um, obviously, I didn't know how she would react to me, her quote best friend, talking about Alzheimer's. Um, I yeah. don't think it would have bothered her at this point. But uh -huh. you know, I was um, I erred on the side of caution. I did play uh -huh. a, a little bit once when I talked to um, some people about doggies, doggy caregivers, and uh -huh. she did like that a little bit. But um, yeah, she needed those like 10 minute or five minute episodes because sure. she just couldn't track long enough with, yes. you know, the longer ones. So and where did I suggest to go ahead? I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. Because I was going to ask a quick question. <laughs> OK, I was just going to suggest that just kind of reiterate what I said earlier about breaking up a, a, an activity. So someone who doesn't have a large attention span, a long attention span, it's okay. Just do a few minutes, you know, stop, do something else, come back to it. Um, so that gives the opportunity to follow through with something, but not necessarily continuously. And that is perfectly okay. Yeah. Cause cooking can be a little, it's a lot of steps a lot of mental processing so it can be yeah. it can be tiring i mean it's tiring for us so yeah. it would definitely it, be a lot for them if we were like oh let's all make the thanksgiving meal together yeah no that's why you got to keep it simple you got to keep yeah. it really simple and be and be prepared get your mise en place and all your ingredients in front of you uh have your utensils that you're going to use out so that you don't have to be searching the kitchen for something that you forgot to put down so being prepared before you bring your loved one or your care recipient into the kitchen is is going to help make the activity much smoother go and 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 go seamlessly. Which makes sense. I I take everything like when I bake, like every all the ingredients out of the pantry and the cabinet, yeah. whatever. And as yeah. I use them, I put them away because they got to go away I anyway. Do the same thing. And yeah. then if you get distracted, phone rings or whatever happens, uh -huh. and you're like, uh, did I put the baking powder in there? If the baking powder's uh -huh. on the counter, probably didn't. If the baking yeah. powder's put away, I probably did. Because, you know, it's hard to tell uh -huh. if you got a teaspoon of baking powder on top of three cups of flour. It's like, is it yeah. in there? I don't know. So that's that's my little trick. And my husband loves to, like... Everything chopped, and he uses every little tiny bowl we own, and that drives me bananas because I don't like that many well, dishes. But whatever, you know. Yeah. But it would definitely have helped my mom, and then you know, like I could have. I make a, a it's called vegestroni, and it's just all vegetable soup with a little bit of nice. Italian flavoring, and a lot of it is just dump. Cut the bag open, dump it. You know, green be you know the little cut chopped frozen green beans, broccoli, whatever. Yeah. It's you know, she could have helped with that. So, yeah, you know, definitely. This is definitely. this is why I keep doing this show, because I am still learning. And it's been two and a half <laughs> years since my mom passed away. And I feel like if I'm still learning good stuff, then we must be sharing good stuff. So where yeah. can people find out more about you and yes, Dr. They Bernstein? Can go, they, can, I, they can go to the power of five life and the number five. It's the number dot com. And my cookbook is called The Power of Five Test Kitchen, which is all about healthy, healthy eating. And this is for the caregivers and has all the front matter and the back matter that we talked about today, but in much more detail. So it's a guide for caregivers to really um, bring someone and feel comfortable bringing someone into the kitchen. Um, but you can go to our website and you can sign up to get healthy recipes delivered right to your mailbox. We have some free offers of uh, many the holidays are coming. I made a full on um, uh, holiday meal for you to blow your 
relatives away with. And so that is a free download as well as um, a mini cookbook on um, fantastic um, salads, spring salads. So those two are available. And then Dr. Bernstein's uh, Notes on Living Longer is also available for free. So those, those three things, um, you, so you can order um, any of that. We have a library um, that you can order the books at as well. And Dr. Bernstein's books and my books. And you can also get it on uh, Amazon if you wish. Um, so I'd love to see See you guys connect with me. You're welcome to email me at any time. It's Melissa at power of five, the number five life.com. I'm happy to get people with questions and happy to get questions so I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and any suggestions that I can give, I'm happy to share. Well, that's a fantastic offer and I appreciate it. And as always, the website is linked in the show notes. Um, so you can go there. And find all that great stuff she just mentioned because whew, that sounds like we should all head there right now. <laughs> and I'll probably I probably sign up for the recipes. Right now. Well, the other <laughs> thing is we just launched our course on on um, the power of five, your journey to health and wellness. So that course is also available and there's a big discount on that course right now. You can take it at your leisure and it's Dr. Bernstein's book on the power of five broken into modules where you see Dr. Bernstein and myself talk about different issues with lots of resources. And um, so it's called the Power of Five um, online course. And you can also see that on our website and log in. And there is a um, special introductory offer right now if you want to get healthier and yeah. live and live longer. Not that live you're not well healthy, longer. <laughs> live well, yes. Age well, age well. And live longer. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate this. I hope for those of you who are listening, you jump over to the YouTube and watch the video because it's quite heartwarming. And just the chatting part also has the pictures of the adaptive equipment. Might want to see that. And, you know, might want to see us. We're cute. That's <laughs> right. You might want to see us. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate this. And Very I'm looking forward Thank to learning you. more. You're welcome. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.